Well, thanks, guys. It's uh, really good to be here in the uh, presence of greatness like Tyrell and everything. <laughs> um, um, Riley, um, actually, Riley lost him. Slivka did these videos and uh, he was really amazing. I didn't, uh, thank goodness for video editing, first of all. But, uh, uh, he really does an amazing job with his drone and, and running the whole interviews and everything. Uh, so if you guys ever have a chance to be involved with him, I would do it. Um, so, yeah, as the video alluded to, Lacey and I started making some management changes, some big ones this uh, last year. We, uh, we were thinking of some changes anyway, and then in May we went to a ranching for profit school in Oklahoma, and, and, uh, and that put some hard numbers to, and some structure to the things that we've been thinking about doing. Um, so we decided to add some different livestock species and just cattle to our operation. And we really got shoehorned into it this year with the second year of drought and grasshopper pressure. Um, but also we had financial reasons we were looking at doing. And, and when we started looking at our resource base um, in a broader sense, we had resources for different livestock species. So, our grass resource has been, uh, had a lot of pressure on it the last three years actually with grasshoppers. They've really not let um, our grass rest at all. So even though we, we can get cattle, move through some paddocks, you know, pretty quick, um, it hasn't mattered because there's been a crop of grasshoppers right behind the cattle mowing off any regrowth. And much of our resource base is uh, tame or introduced species because a lot of our place was farmed at one point. And those grasshoppers really, um, we feel one of their ecological niches is to rid the landscape of non-native species because uh, they really um, eat on those tame species of grass and even trees. So our, what few cottonwoods we have don't have any grasshopper pressure. But Russian olives, elm trees, things like that. Um, they'll eat all the leaves off those trees. So, just uh, things that come to mind when you have too much time looking at grasshoppers. <laughs> um, and yeah, as our as our cattle numbers, as we're destocking our cattle numbers, um, we've got we've got a couple hired that we'd like to keep around. We have overheads to cover, so we just put our heads together and. Start thinking of ways that uh, we can keep paying the bills with uh, you know, even different livestock species. So, and our and our grass resource um, needs rain and rest at this point. Um, we decided on the um, hair sheep enterprise after we done quite a bit of research. We have a neighbor west of us who bought about 100 of them last year and he had had bull sheep as well and he felt his hair those hair sheep browsed a lot more than the wool sheep did so he had a lot more brush species and even uh, small ponderosa pine trees that his hair sheep were cleaning the neighbors off of and, and things and and with that and we have so much electric fence on our place now and uh, we needed to be able to shop them. So, <laughs> so uh, we decided to go the, the hair sheep route. And we'll see if it's true or not, but we've heard that they have a higher reproductive rate since they're not building fleece, that they put that extra energy into reproductive trees. Um, now, the poultry enterprises are very small, small scale so far. Uh, we had about 170 broilers this year in two different groups which is about 100% increase from last year. So it's, if we keep that up, things might get out of control here a little bit. Um, um, we had some really neat things happen with the, with the poultry and the grasshoppers um, in our yard. 
in our yard, and then Jen and Mario are hired folks in their yard as well. We were pretty strategic in how we ran those broilers to try and mitigate the grasshopper pressure. Um, each of these enterprises hasn't required any you know, major, um, major expenses, I guess, as far as um, building chicken tractors or coops and buying hog panels for, to make our corrals, our cow corrals, sheep proof, I guess. Here's a video of us uh, letting our broilers out in the morning. Um, and they're taken after the hoppers. And when we get into this video, I'll have you guys notice um, a, our garden will kind of be on the right side of where these broilers are. Yeah, it's pretty fun to watch them actually fly a coop. They're pretty excited to get out there and get to hunt the grasshoppers. They, they, they know if they go first thing in the morning that the grasshoppers are pretty slow still. <laughs> so then as I walk up behind them here, they're, they're foraging on the hoppers. And to the right of where these broilers are, you can see not much of a garden there. It just looks like some fence posts and weeds and straw. But I have a picture coming up to compare that to. So I'm just. Is that your playlist? <laughs> That didn't sound like the garden song. <laughs> so, just yesterday I stepped out and took a picture of, a, of our garden now, and, and we have to tip our hat to Patty on this year. She helped us design our garden here a little bit, but we had written it off earlier this summer because uh, last summer the grasshoppers completely mowed it down. Um, and after we got, it might have been the same moisture like PJ was talking about the 1st of August, um, this all came alive. So we kind of had some tomato plants planted, but this is only one squash plant that's grown the whole, throughout the whole thing. But we don't know really why the grasshoppers left. Finally, we don't know if there's a form sensing thing going on with the hoppers and, you know, after um, their buddies get picked off one by one for a couple months if they finally <laughs> You know, get tired of uh, being in our yard and leave. But traditionally, our yard is worse than anywhere on the ranch, and, and they got to a point this summer where there were hardly any hoppers in the yard where the chickens were. I should say that. Here's a video of the sheep. So I just wanted to take this video to show you guys how they were, they just willingly were browsing like on that silver sage there and there, there's some snowberry right where I'm standing um, and I haven't noticed them browsing on that uh, very much yet. And also, uh, we bought open ewes but we have a bunch of lambs so if any Sheep people in here can tell me what an open you actually means. <laughs> Get that straight down for me. I would appreciate that. Um, here's just a picture of the sage. They don't, they don't really eat the twigs off of it or anything. They're, they're just uh, eating the leaves off of it. Um, and we're using a three-wire poly to fence these sheep in right now, and and. Uh, we left them about a week in our lot around our house and 
built this same fence on the inside of the lot fence and then we would take those sheep right on the fence line every day and let them really swirl and boil into that fence and they'd, come, they'd get shocked and come sailing out over the rest of the bunch and, and we tried to do a really good job training those sheep to that fence before we put it out on the range with them. Um, and both these enterprises uh, are quite family friendly. The, the uh, kids like being around the sheep and the chickens both. And, uh, and nobody's, uh, the meanest thing out there is dad sometimes when we're trying to gather chickens or something like that. So, um, um, no, it's, it's been good and we, we want more diversity in our plant communities out on the landscape and, and so we think that you know, uh, we should have maybe a diversity of animal species out there as well. So we'll see where the sheep thing we're really excited about. The, the poultry thing we, we really don't have any idea about, but um, we've heard some pretty big numbers as far as demand for local broilers and, and turkeys. And local, I mean buildings, but uh, population centers. But um, if we're trying to look at things differently instead of a position of scarcity of maybe not abundance but um, what the landscape has that we can harvest from. That's it. Thank you guys. Okay, any questions? Um, let's go without the mic again. I don't think we need it. So go ahead and shoot. I'm dying to know, Casey, how far did you have to go to get those sheep? Uh, most of them came out of Wyoming, but we bought one group from Big Timber, from Ag News down in Big Timber. Alex, a question. You butcher your own chickens? Or we you? did, yeah, yeah, uh, last year and this year both. And, and uh, last year we had never done it before, we just YouTubed whatever we could, and, <laughs> and uh, it felt like work for sure, but by, the, by our third setup, now this this fall, at, uh, we did 80 in how long? Two and a half hours or something. Yeah. And you can direct market them to people, or is that, well, is that work? we, you know, if folks show up and want to help us do it, then we give them sound. <laughs> folks in town, folks in town, uh, take sounds and family, and so we haven't really. Uh, marketed those those birds and and federal federal and state inspect poultry plants in Montana are uh, not available really. So that I know of we're exploring all that too though. Yeah. Can you take them out on the tractor? Take the tractor? How long usually in the area? Uh, they were basically in the well, they went from the brooder, they went from the brooder over to our chicken tractor at about three weeks, maybe four weeks. And uh, they they basically stayed in the same area, just in our, in our yard. And we, we were going to keep them in that chicken tractor and we saw the grasshopper pressure coming again. And we had one stock dog that had a bad history with chickens and we put a training collar on her and got a just perfect setup just right, you know, where we got the hammer at the right spot and she never she never bothered the chickens all summer. So so that then we were able to just let them free range during the day. Yeah. What breed are they, Casey? What breed of chickens? Mm. Hatchery special. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kind of the the segments out of the the uh, Stuff that wouldn't fit in the hatchery, they're the cheapest ones, so that's what we got. Yeah. Do you use dogs for predator control? Or? Um, if we went big, bigger scale out the pasture, we would look at uh, guard animal on the pasture. Because that, that's what some of the folks you know, are, that are really doing this have, for sure. Yep. But uh, for the sheep, we don't have anything right now. Um, we're way in the pros and cons of dogs. We have neighbors with dogs. And uh, so we might be able to kind of use their dogs 
the way they those dogs are traveling. Um, and we have some friends down at Cohagen that have burrows with their sheep and like those real well. So we're trying to figure all that out. How are you um, changing your fences, your cattle fences, and your sheep? Well, we're uh, thinking on our three wire electric. That's about a 20 inch bottom wire that, um, well, two things. We want to bond the sheep to the cattle eventually and not run them separate herds. Um, and we're hoping that the sheep just want to stay with those cattle. But we think we can get away with one poly wire at about 10 inches on those um, permanent three wires when we go into those certain paddocks. You know, so we'll have to fence those paddocks as we travel through them. But it's all an R and D right now. <laughs> so if you if you have those sheep with the cattle, that eliminate the need for guard dogs. Maybe we don't know yet. We our our friend's theory, and uh, we'll see if it's right or not. If you bonded them to a group of yearlings, and he said those you know yearlings being yearlings are checking out everything all the time, and he said. Can you imagine the stampede of cattle that would happen if a lamb bleats out after a coyote gets a hold of it? You know, stampede of cattle over to check that out. And so he makes a valid point, and we might use use the curiosity of the yearlings as you know to our advantage. We'll see how that works. Any other questions? How many acres are the cows running on? The cows? Yeah, the acreage for the cows. About In each paddock or total ranch? Or, uh, 6,200. Yeah. How often do you move Cows? Sheep? Uh, cows, some just depends. Uh, we don't really have a set uh, recipe. We're on daily moves for um, quite a bit of this year. We'll be on daily moves. And then our longest, we want to be at uh, 14 days. Yeah. And the sheep right now in this, we just wanted to get our calves weaned off the cows before we tried putting the sheep with the cows. And they're on about a three, three or four day pack setup. Will you graze, if you graze something like in April or May, will you, not this year, but if you have a good year from where should we hit it again? Or do you get 11 months rest or whatever? If it's tame, if it's tame ground, we'll come back again in the fall. If it's native ground, we'll just hit it once in the growing season. All right, let's give Casey one more hand.